Kathy already mentioned, and I'm going to try this thing out. Is it the green dot? No, it's the arrows. It's the arrows. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, isn't that cute? Okay. Uh, first of all, Kathy mentioned we're sixth in the nation in 2010. We're always slightly lagging on data from the C CDC. Um, we, we keep our own stats, obviously, in the state. Uh, in 2010, we were 49 percent higher than the national average. The national average was 12.4 and we're 18.5 um, was our, and when we talk about deaths, when we talk about 12.4, we're talking about 12.4 deaths per 100,000. And so we were 18.9 deaths per 100,000. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in adolescents and youth in Idaho. Nationally, it has been third, but that just changed in February. Uh, SAMHSA announced that for the first time, uh, death by suicide overtook uh, the sec took the second place in the nation. It used to be murder, so I don't think that's necessarily a better trade. But anyway, the sad statistic that I think is at least very very troubling is that between 2007 and 2011, that's five years, 78 school-aged children in Idaho died by suicide. And that's under the age of 18. And we do five-year uh, trends in our suicide because it's hard when you have such a small state to look at trends if you just do year by year. As a matter of fact, it gets very troubling. We get our statistics, a lot of our data from the Idaho Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This is given every year randomly in Idaho schools and schools across the nation so we can compare uh, 2012's that should be out right now, May, and it's given usually in the spring. Schools are random. There were 48 schools in this survey, 1,700 students, and those students, 27% said that they had been depressed enough to quit activities in the last, for at least two weeks in the last 12 months. One in seven of those students reported that they had seriously considered suicide, and 13% said that they had actually made a plan. Now, when you look at the average classroom, when you think about one in seven, one in eight students contemplating suicide, when you think about students having plans, that affects what's going on in that classroom. And this, is, this says that 8% of high school females and 4.6% of high school males reported making a suicide attempt. Suicide attempts in our state, we talk about those, it's really hard to get an accurate uh, count of attempts because we have all the privacy laws. But we, we think that about $38 million goes for suicide attempts in the state per year, and that's in like $2,010. At any time in the United States, one in five adolescents suffers from serious depression. Now our data shows one in four from that Idaho Risk Behavior Survey. And the good news is that suicide is preventable and it's everybody's responsibility. And that's where the Idaho, plan, the Idaho Council's plan comes in. There's something in that plan that everybody can do. We want people to understand that suicide is complex. That doesn't mean that we can't understand it. It means that there are many factors involved. So it's not one thing that leads to someone's death. We also like to say that people really don't like want to die. They just want to have the pain in, whether it's emotional or physical pain. We say physical pain because lots of times, Idaho's another group for Idaho that's serious for suicide is older uh, men especially, older white men especially. Uh, most people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental health issue. Uh, obviously, substance abuse comes in there. Uh, SAMHSA thinks that 73% of people who died by suicide had chemicals in their in their body. Uh, we say 90% have probably depression or other treatable mental health issue. This is also another statistic that is all over the place. We say 20 to 25 attempts are made for every completed suicide, every death by suicide. Uh, there are stats out there that say 30 attempts. Once again, it's one of those hard facts to get a grip on because of the privacy laws. We also want to make a point that suicide is relatively rare. When you talk about 12.4% or 12.4 people 
and 100,000 dying by suicide, or 18.9 as it is in Idaho, dying by suicide. That's still a rare number. And we like to say that around children. We like them to not think that suicide is a, is a common way to die. The sad thing is, is that remember that there's a family around that child, or there's friends around that child, there's a community, there's a school around that child. So a lot of people are affected. We know that we can solve suicide if we treat it as a health issue because easily accessible, affordable, and culturally appropriate mental health help helps people to solve their issues so they can relieve that pain. One of the best theories we have out there is called the Interpersonal Theory of Suicide is by Dr. Thomas Joyner. He's been to Idaho several times, including once at our conference. And he's done research for many, many years. His own father died by suicide. And he has looked at all the data and now has his own clinic. And I think he's at the University of Southern Florida, if I'm not mistaken. And he, his clinic continues to do research here. But they've figured out that there are two major traits for people who are successful in dying, and we don't use the word successful, who manage to die by suicide. Uh, first of all, they have to have the desire to die. And this is a place where we can really affect suicide rates. First of all, the desire to die by suicide is a perceived burden, burdensomeness. That means that my death is worth more than my life to my family, to my friends, to my community. I say perceived because remember that the brain is ir irrational when it's suicidal. People are not thinking straight. And for you, this is a double whammy because remember they don't have that frontal uh, lobe fully developed. So they perceive that I'm a burden to my family. I'm not going to tell my mom that I need to see somebody because I feel really depressed. We can't afford it right now. So they perceive that they're a burden. The other thing, the other area that we can really affect is belongingness. People feel as if they don't belong. And what's interesting about this, they may be, and I had a student that was like this. The student was outstanding. He was loved by every kid in the hall. He, he was on the football team. He'd been their captain. He was uh, in drama club. Everybody seemed to love him. And, I, and when he, we talked about his being suicidal, he said, well, I really don't belong anywhere. And I said, what do you mean? You know, this club, you've got a great family, and blah, blah. And he said, I'm a fraud. If people really knew how I am, they wouldn't lie. So thwarted belongingness, those are the, the desire to die. The second part of this is the acquired ability. And this is also the habituation to pain. This is getting used to seeing pain or getting used to feeling pain, physical pain. Um, and she's right, cutters are not in that group. However, anorexics are in the group of uh, high, high at risk for suicide because they've already learned how to squelch that need to live. Uh, it's a learned ability. It can be repeated self-harm. Youngsters who continually get in accidents, youngsters who continually get in fights, youngsters who take risky behaviors, uh, drive fast, uh, you know, use a lot of drugs, alcohol, they may be plant, you know, kind of habituating to dying. Uh, lots of times, witnessing repeated emotional or physical pain is also a way to habituate. In that group we have, doctors, um, dentists, lawmen, <coughs> military, and prostitutes. Those are all high-risk groups in our society, and they all witness or feel pain themselves on a regular basis. And uh, Dr. Germain mentioned abuse, especially when young. We now know this is a pretty serious risk factor. It promotes that uh, chaotic living atmosphere, and we know that it affects the brain as, as children grow up. If you put this in a chart, this is Dr. Joyner's own chart. It looks like this. Now, I want to point out that not everybody who perceives themselves as a burden or feels like they really don't belong anyplace or sees pain regularly or, fit, or feels pain regularly is going to die by suicide. I don't want to indicate that at all. It's only when those three things overlap, and actually it's two, the desire and the ability. When those overlap, that's where we get our group who can die by suicide. And for parents, one of the best things that they can do is learn warning signs. 
One warning sign by itself may not mean a thing. Remember, we're dealing with adolescence. Adolescence on any given day can be totally great, having a great day, and a half an hour later, it's the end of the world. So keep that in mind. One sign by itself may not mean anything. It bears watching. If your son or daughter or neighbor's kids start threatening to kill themselves talking about it or writing about it, I'd take it seriously. I'd watch for some other signs. A previous suicide attempt is a pretty serious sign because it means they've already started learning how to habituate themselves to that pain. They've started getting, over, getting used to the idea that they can die. Remember, our very first instinct is to live. So this is a practice. Uh, if, you, if you see or know that someone is looking for means, to, means like guns, I've never been interested in guns. Remember, Kurt Cobain was anti-guns, and he killed himself with one. Uh, kind of loading up on medication, those kind of things, start paying attention. If there's statements of feeling trapped or hopeless, why do I keep going to school? Yeah, I don't plan to graduate anyway, those kinds of things. When they withdraw, they want to stay in their room. Uh, don't want to go on the, on the picnic, don't want to go on the family camping trip, don't want to be with their friends, real clues that something's going on. Dramatic mood changes, once again, this is a tough one with adolescents, uh, being very, very down. The other thing we tell parents is this, if your kid's been down for two or three weeks, or four or longer, you know they've been depressed, and they haven't gotten medication, they haven't been to a doctor, watch for the sudden calm, peaceful feeling, because then they may have made a plan and if the plan somehow brings a sense of calm to people. So once again, if they haven't been to a doctor, they're not on the meds, and there's a nice change in that behavior, I'd, I'd ask them, I would ask the words. Uh, if you see an increased use in, in drugs or alcohol, friends or family members, the inability to sleep, and I wanna go back to that one. We know that the brain that is deprived of sleep has a lot harder time dealing with reality. So keep in mind, if someone's not sleeping, they're up two-thirds of the night, uh, check in with them, see what's going on. Changes in weight or eating habits, lots of times, you know, why bother to eat if you're, if you're just gonna die? Withdrawal from friends, where he did that one. Agitation or anxiety. We now know that people who are extremely agitated, lots of times they can't get over the fidgets. They, spend two or three days, they're contemplating what they're gonna do. Rage and, and the fighting for boys, raging for boys is, is really a, a sign that you need to take, take seriously. Um, giving away favorite things, uh, we had a young man, I think it was in North Idaho, went into a funeral home to make his own plans. Fortunately, the funeral director had the good sense to call the family. If, the stu if this has been a student who cares about school and suddenly is neglecting his or her schoolwork, or used to care about how he or she looked and they are not, you might check in on that. The stress signs, chronic headaches, stomach aches and fatigue, and the recent loss of a relationship, a friend, a close friend. Once again, not one sign. I have a, a, a Cynthia Maseral who has Region 3 span suggest it this way. She's also a counselor at College of Idaho. It's like having a cup and it's full of water and you keep adding drops in it. Well, you know, that cohesion thing will hold the water in there for a while, but one more thing and that one more drop of water losing their, that close relationship, their friend says they don't want to be their friend anymore. That could be the one. Once again, one sign generally don't have to worry too much. However, all signs are reasons <coughs> to kind of watch, be aware especially if it's the attempt in the past, the non-sleeping, and then that agitation, if they're not usually a person who's easily agitated. What can parents do? One of the best things to do, and I have a son who's been suicidal, is listen non-judgmentally. It's the hardest thing in the world. My last name's Gabbert, you can see I am. So to do this and listen, and really listen, just let them say whatever and go, well, yeah, you know how I feel about that, but go ahead and tell me. You can do this in a drive in the car so that that non-face-to-face -face somehow sets kids free uh, to talk. Take walks, get in the habit of regular family walks. 
Learn the warning signs. It's okay to ask your child if he or she is considering suicide. And you don't want to say, you're not thinking about harming yourself, are you? Because you suddenly said, don't tell me that you're going to hurt yourself. And it, the words harming yourself will be taken differently by an adolescent than killing yourself. Trust me. No, I'm not going to harm myself. I'm going to kill myself. Um, but ask him directly, are you considering suicide? It's the hardest thing you'll probably ever have to do. But the harder thing will be if they do something and you didn't ask it. Analyze how much pressure your student is in. If this is a good student, and quite frankly, suicide affects every kind of student, every kind of kid, every kind of family. You may have this kid who's just absolutely wonderful, does really well. I had a young lady come to me, and she was AP, and I think she had six AP classes. I just felt so tired when she told me about it all. Anyway, she was under so much pressure, but to drop one class meant that she wasn't okay. So we had to get her through all that. She would rather have died than drop an AP class. Uh, request that your family doctor assess a student for depression. I don't mind going ahead of my son. He's 29 now, and I still do it. As a matter of fact, he has our family doctor. I call ahead and say, my son's coming in. Would you please assess him for depression? And you know she can't say yes or no because he's 29 now. But make sure your family doctor knows how to assess for suicide. Ask them before you send your son or daughter in if they can assess for suicide or at least do a good depression screening. Make sure that they know and are going to take the time. Be sure that your child finds success at some things. Remember the burdensomeness. Um, you know, maybe they're not going to be a football player or a ballerina. Find what they love. Maybe they're great at beating you at Scrabble. Whatever. Maybe they're good at trout fishing. Find whatever it is that they are great at and do it with them. Build in that, hey, I can do something. And I always used to say this to my kid. I don't care what you do, you're never a burden. You're never a burden. <clears throat> and rid your house of means. If you think, if you have a depressed child, get rid of that gun. And this is a hard sell in Idaho. But Take them to moms, take them to, and you have to be careful about your friend's houses also. Alert the friend's parents that you'd like their guns locked up. Lock away extra medication. If, if you're worried about knives, lock them away. Get them out just when you're doing that cooking dinner with them. Uh, until things are at least better. Uh, when you're gonna talk to kids about suicide, avoid talking about statistics. Did you know 78 kids died in Idaho and we, you know, they don't need to know that. And don't talk about means. Did you know that most of those kids died by strangulation? You don't need to talk about that. Um, it's not that it's going to give them ideas, but if they're vulnerable, it may give them a little push. Parents in schools. You know, you have a right to know your, your school. You have a right to know the, your child's teachers and principal. And, and somebody said, hey, make it positive. Go in when things are going great and say, hey, my kid really loved this, and volunteer if you have time. Uh, be sure that you know if your child is bullied. Now, bullying does not cause suicide. Every kid who's bullied does not die by suicide. That said, it might be that one little drop of water in that already over, over full cup. And I worry personally about the bullies as much as I worry about the bullied. Somebody who's a bully is telling you something about him or herself. Keep that in mind. You have to watch social media for bullying. It's almost insidious and hard to get to. But oh, that's why communication with your kid helps. Um, check to see what the school does to make sure kids belong. Hey, we've got, the, we've got the athletics out there. What are you doing for my kid who doesn't play sports? What's going on? Do, do, does every school dance have, a, have to have a date? Is that the main uh, activity for kids? Let's figure out ways to do things that are for every kid. If your child is struggling in school, schools have ways to help see what's going on. And you might have to be a little pushy. It's OK. I was a school counselor. We want to know that you're caring about that kid. Ask the school for help. Call the school psych, the school counselors, the school social worker, and if they don't have them, call the principal. 
Uh, make sure you, that your child and his or her friends know not to keep the code of silence. The code of silence is, if I tell anybody that my friend said he's going to kill himself, he's not going to like me anymore. And then I say to them, well, he's not going to like you when he's dead either. You can, if you don't tell, I tell my kids this, if you don't tell, it's about you. It's about your worrying that your friend won't like you. If you tell, you're making it about your friend because you care more about your friend getting help than you care about yourself feeling better. We have some good resources for you. You can always call me at SPAN Idaho. I just mentioned to you the, the Idaho Suicide Prevention Plan. I call it Action. It's on our website. Go to SpanIdaho.org. There's a big button down there. It has community activities, great, great activities, um, and there's some great stories in there. That's us, Suicide Prevention Action Network of Idaho. We're statewide with the American Association on Suicidology. Just go to suicidology.org. They have all kinds of materials for you. The same for the American Federation on Suicide Prevention. Uh, the SPRC, somebody, did somebody mention, I think somebody mentioned the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. These are best practice, evidence-based activities and information. SAMHSA also has lots of free publications for you. Just go to SAMHSA.org and hit the publications button. The Trevor Project is for uh, children who are uh, gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, or questioning. And I put that one on there twice. But what I really put on my own, because I didn't get to read my notes, was NAMI, uh, National Alliance of Mentally, Mental Illness.org. They have great uh, activities and they have groups all over Idaho also. Thanks.